about right. Episode 18 of Deadwood Review. Um, we got our, we got a new drink now. We've got a new drink, which is the famous Groose uh, <sighs> Scotch whiskey. Something very expensive, where Francis Walcott surprises Cy Tolliver. What did you think of the episode? Um, Something very expensive. That's a lot of whiskey. Yes. What did you think of? Something very expensive. Oh. Well, I just put whiskey down my shirt. Oh well. Um, it was a fantastic episode. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, so we've got quite a lot of things going on yeah. in the episode. The biggest uh, kind of game-changing event is Francis Wilcott is pushed into a position where uh, Cy Tolliver kind of um, gets the better of him. Yeah. Um, Cy Tolliver's like, I hear that you like uh, uh, violence towards prostitutes. Yeah. And uh, he's like, you think that can get the better of me? Yeah. Were well, you completely right? <laughs> yeah. um, so he, uh, he, he, for the past episodes, he only is obsessed over this like one prostitute. Yeah. Who kind of knows how to, you know, who get him implied off. implied might be his cousin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, who knows how to kind of get him off? Um, and she's not there, so he's like, I'll have her. So well, he a, takes her because she's the one who's right yeah. to Sai. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So he wants to kind of get back at Sai kind of thing. So. Yeah. He k kills that prostitute and then he kills. Um, he kills the woman that he, he, kills, he actually. Um, yeah. the, the one that might be his cousin. And then he, he kills. Is it Maddie? Maddie, the, um, the proprietor. The proprietor of the uh, whole oh, house, yes. The bordello. That sequence is amazing. It's, oh, yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's horrifying, yeah. intense. What I didn't remember is I remembered it being just one continuous five minute sequence. Wow. But every time, like, he goes in the door, then it cuts away to, like, Al talking to uh, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee is Mr. the, Lee. um, is Mr. Wu's opponent. The San Francisco cocksucker. The San Francisco cocksucker. Yeah. And then it, yeah, and then it cuts back and it cuts away. It's amazing. Like, it's great, yeah. What's especially, like, good is that, like, when it cuts away to things, they're sort of more comedic. Yeah. It yeah. never dilutes the tension of the Francis oh, Walcott scene, yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. So that's like probably the, the biggest game of game changing of the season and uh, yeah. Joni sends the other prostitutes away at the end. Yeah. Uh, so we, we kind of don't know where this leaves her character basically. Again point. though, showing that she's like the only person who has any kind of... she Like the people at the bottom, like she's at the bottom, have sort of empathy for other characters. Yeah. Like she actually spends her money to send them away rather yeah. than she actually can, has concern rather than some of the characters. Like if it was Sai, he probably would have just given them up. Well, that's the thing, like, in the, in the follow-up scene, when, when Sai goes to the uh, bordello, mm. um, he's like, you, you get yourself out of here and we'll sort this out. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he doesn't care. <laughs> no. Uh, he only cares now that he's kind of got an upper hand over Francis, um, Walcott. Francis Wilcott. Now he's got this thing, but he's killed these three women. He, he's kind of got something, a bit of leverage he can use against him. Yeah. Which is uh, the essential thing for Sai. Yeah. So in retrospect, Francis, that was a pretty stupid thing to do. Yes. Um, it's, it's amazing the sort of way it leads up to it though. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, the, there's the line where he says, um, I am best surprised. Yeah. Meaning that he, surprised. he can't be surprised by anything that um, Francis Walcott would do. He's yeah, basically going to yeah. say he's, he's using it as leverage because there's no way that Francis Walcott can surprise him. That's it. Yeah. So he goes off trying to surprise him and failing horribly. Yeah. <laughs> that, that speech is amazing. Yeah. It's like past, um, past one, fall off. The past surprise, and then he goes <laughs> to kill the prostitutes. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a great sequence. It is. Um, so also in this episode, we have Alma uh, propositions the building of a bank with uh, Soul, Soul Star, Star yep. who still sounds like a seventies band to me, <laughs> or a seventies porn star like yeah. Dirk Diggler. <laughs> oh, Dirk Diggler, yeah. <laughs> Dirk Diggler and Soul Star, sorry, bushwhackers. Yeah. I saw that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so and he he's kind of taken aback and he's he's kind of considering. Yeah. Uh, whether we should do it or not. Um, what, what, what else? Steve fucks a horse. Steve fucks a horse. Yeah, the uh, the angry character from the last episode. Steve the drunk. Steve the drunk. Yeah, yeah. He, he he fucks a horse and uh, the the general. The general and Hostetler. And Hostetler gave to sign a, a thing saying, oh, I, I fucked Bullock's horse." Yeah. Because uh, Bullock in a fit of rage just punches him just because he's uh, Steve. Yes. Um, just, just because he deserved it though. He did. Oh, yeah. yeah, he, yeah. He, he deserved it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and we've also got Al kind of back in the game a bit. Yeah. Uh, Al's kind of semi back up and, and running. He's, uh, I would say, like the first half of this episode almost serves as like a mini recap to the audience. Yeah. Um, not that it's, it's not doing like a cheap way, like previously on Deadwood. Yeah. Uh, it's like it makes sense because Al's been out of action for the past three or four episodes, so it makes sense being the guy who wants to have all his hands in all the pockets. He needs to get caught up in all the. 
goings on in the camp so it makes sense to recap what's happened to Al and they kind of recap to us the audience because things are getting quite yeah. dense with well, what's going on. Well what they do that's clever is it's EB who tells him and they mm. use that to explore EB's relationship with him oh, yeah, yeah. and how EB can be bought off as easily with like a uh, with like a sandwich probably because he's that, yeah. that much of an idiot. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, I mean, like he, he fully admits to Albert, yeah, this guy bought me off. Uh, I have two thousand dollars, which is cool. But obviously, we've been. Al probably assumes that no one's going to believe EB, but that allows him to put the pieces together that Sai is uh, yeah. uh, one spreading the rumors. Paul, Mr. Merrick. Um, his press is uh, destroyed. His press is destroyed. I, I love Mr. Merrick. He's, <laughs> he like he stands out so much in Deadwood. He's like. Uh, you know, he's obviously an educated, intelligent man, and he's, he's incredibly camp, and he just he stands out completely in Deadwood. <laughs> he tries to be like a like a, a gentleman, but he just comes across as a bit of a bumbling boob. Yes. Um, and so he he's uh, showing the new school teacher teacher around, and then his presses are destroyed by Sai. Yeah. Sai's becoming a much more formidable opponent in this That's season it, yeah, than he was yeah. in the first season. He had no leverage before. Now he's got Francis Walcott. Now it's almost like Powers Booth is well enough now to actually go out and do scenes and stuff. But but, but bless his soul. Yes. Uh, Silas as well has a deepening relationship with um, Miss Isringhausen. Miss Isringhausen, which I still don't. Okay, so ex explain what's going on there. I've got an idea, but Miss Isringhausen has been paid by someone. It's ambiguous. I think throughout but at this point, definitely whether she's been paid by Alma's parents. To try and she was paid to get in with Alma yeah. and then lie and say that Alma told her that she killed her husband uh, so people could take her incredible gold claim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's that's why she's there. And especially the way she, uh, her, her father was kind of literally thrown out of the camp by Bullock, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. that he would hire someone to go back in, get them to lie about Alma yeah. saying that uh, she killed her husband. Okay. Yes. So, yes, a dense episode that was still stunning and visceral and this is the thing, and it it could have been like really wordy and obtuse, but it's really visceral and like it is. tense as hell. You, know, you go along with it, don't you? Yes. Uh, so so for ages, you kind of have been waiting for all this stuff to kind of bubble over with um, Wilcott, yeah. Mr. Wilcott. Yeah, and, and the, the scene itself is 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 horrific. It is it's really difficult to watch, and uh, the kind of a cold nature goes around killing the the prostitutes, and then uh, whatever her name is. Yeah, and um, yeah. Bordello lady. Molly or. Yeah. Molly or. Ma yeah. Maddie or. Maddie it is, yeah. So he kills them and all, did you know, is by slitting their throats, which yeah. is what Al always does. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like it's sort of seen as a cold sort of. Well, I think the, what was, because he's doing that, it's sort of a quick, relatively painless way to kill someone, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I think that it's meant to imply that he isn't doing it out of malice, he's just insane. Yeah, it's just crazy. But this also brings up a good point about why I think they hired him as well as Jack McCall to play Francis Walcott. Oh yeah. Which was that in the first season, Fran like Jack McCall is the sort of villain, isn't it? He yeah. brings about a lot of things and it's to show how Deadwood reacts to a transgression in the law. Yeah. Because there is no law, so what do you do when someone... I think this is meant to be, what what does Deadwood do when there's just a figure of pure evil? Oh yeah. yeah. Like in the first season, like the way that, Fran that um, Jack McCall killed Wild Bill Hickok, at least it made sense. Yeah, yeah. He was slighted yeah. and he did it in a way where everyone could see. And it was, yeah. But it clearly, it was like, it seemed more just than this, where he's just going out murdering <laughs> prostitutes. Yeah, just coldly killing him, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like a serial killer. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about it. It's almost yeah. like a, a Michael Myers kind of Halloween yeah. thing, yeah. Or even Jack uh, the Ripper. Yeah. Who was uh, a similar kind of time, obviously in a different mm. place. But yeah, he's completely or insane. Sweeney and, Todd. Or Sweeney Todd, yeah. <laughs> With Sweeney Todd makes even more sense because Sweeney Todd actually did like cut people's necks. Yeah, he's 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 like he's a complete counterpart to a lot of other people because he just he react he just he does it out of instead of the sort of Byzantine plotting that everyone else does, he's just angry. Yeah. So he just takes it out on all these on, on everyone. Yeah. He's uh, yes, it's and he's still in the camp. He's still there. He's still he's yeah. still a threat that people are gonna have to deal with, and he's just pure evil. Yeah. So I, I don't know how we're gonna yeah. sort him out. But it's an interesting counterpart, isn't it? To the fit. I mean, they must they must have cast him for that. It was a ten yeah, I think it was intentional, yeah. Yeah. And you know, like he I don't even reckon I, I don't even know who he was Jack, the guy who played Jack McCauley. He's completely different. He's a great actor. Yes. Cle clearly a very, very talented actor. Yeah. Uh, playing these two complete kind of opposites, but kind of with some similarities. Yeah. Uh, both bring 
some kind of chaos to count through different means. Yes. Um. And um, but almost in a way, Francis Walcott's almost more understand like likable in a way. Like he realizes what he's done is wrong. He's just sort of mentally ill. He just doesn't know how to cope with it. Yeah, like, um, well, there's even a reference to, um, do you remember the speech in the episode Plague? And the reverend gives it, he's talking about how the arm can't function without the brain. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, as soon as he's killed the one that he likes, is it Carrie? He says, well, um, he says, what, um, suppose I cut off my arm? Or some oh, variation yeah, on that. Yeah. Which is a variation on, he is the limb that needs to be removed. Yeah. Do you just cut off the limb? Or how do you function with that as, as a community? Yeah. Again, it brings it... This is the thing, it's like a really tense, visceral scene, but it also plays into all the thought of thematic concerns that David Milch is going to do. Did you think this was the best episode so far? I'm going to look at the, uh, the, the DVDs. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Just oh, like this is the Region 2 box that I wouldn't recommend getting. But if you've got a Region 2 player, buy the fucking... I mean a Region 1 player. A Region 1 player, by the fucking HBO oh, stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, overall, I think this is probably the best episode they've done so far. I think it's better than anything in Season 1. Possibly, yeah. Um, it's tense, it's to... brilliant. It's just, it works on pretty um, much every level. I, I don't think it's the best one. Uh, but it's one of the best. It's like top three. Yeah. Like, along with me. I, th I think maybe the, the ones that kind of hit it home for me were like the... Uh, um, Suffer Little Children. That was amazing, yeah. Uh, the opening of season two and then this episode. Yeah. yeah. I think they've been the highlights of me so far. So this is definitely one of the best. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was great. Uh, it was a nice, after kind of the reprieve of the previous episode, this one kind of ramps it back up again. It is, um, yeah, all the pieces are kind of moving into place for whatever's going to happen, which I still don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Obviously, we're going to have to sort Francis Wilcott out. I don't know how long they can keep going on with sort of like that in camp. Yeah. I suppose Bullock's not really gotten involved. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? He doesn't really know. Charlie Utter knows now. Charlie Utter. I bet mean, um, um, Sai even says a line like, where's Bullock when you need him? Yeah. yeah. The piss of it, yeah. So, yes, um, Seth doesn't know, but, yeah. Isn't it interesting that, like, the two main... There's so many plot lines going on that characters rarely intersect like at this. Like, isn't it weird that Al hasn't met Francis Walcott? Yeah. Or that um, Seth Al was never, in that. Yeah, Al Seth, and stuff. <laughs> like, Al was never set foot in the gym. Like, I, I, think, I think Trixie says that, like, you know, you're still not set foot in the gym. She said Richardson in. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, and there's all these different things where it never feels cramped or... Yeah. I think it's, and all apart, that's just the geography of the camp. It's so, such a small area that it's hard for everything. It, everything feels natural to the world yeah. and like that, but... It's like characters like Charlie Utter in the first season wasn't, he, was, he wasn't really in it very much and he didn't really have as much of a character as he does now. No. But now he's like, he's, he's clearly going to be an integral part of it going forward if he That's knows it, about yeah. Francis Wilcott. And it's just, yeah, a great episode that every every part of it worked. There wasn't a storyline that didn't feel sort of important. Or, yeah. Yeah, and again, there were more stuff about sort of how class works within Deadwood. Like, Francis Wilcott's killing prostitutes. In that hierarchy, they don't really matter. No, no. Like, um, general, the, the general and... Um, Hostetler will now have an advantage over Steve, who in the last episode had, like... And again, mercy that they show towards Steve is another integral part about how people at the bottom of the food chain are more willing to sort of show mercy and kindness yeah. than people at the top. Like, he had every right, really, to kill Steve. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think he could have done it as well. Yeah. I mean, no he, he probably would have gone away with it, because no one likes Steve. He's a drunk. That's it, yeah. He yeah. probably would have been hanged, actually, because he's black. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah. But he still would have had every right to kill him, but yeah. it's that, it's that, I think those are the moments that make Deadwood better than if it was just a revisionist western about, like, there isn't murders every week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's it, yeah. Uh, In fact, has, has this been like one of the few, like, has this been one of the first murders of the season? Like, there wasn't any last episode, there wasn't many, oh, there's been a few, but not of like a main character. Not like a main character, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is where the whole season's sort of ramping up a bit now. But I'd say it, it almost feels like the, the kind of the, the first Western where it does feel like an accurate portrayal of Western life, where like in Revision of Westerns it's like, you know, the hero, you know, kills the villains every single, in every single movie, or yeah. it's a huge operatic event like in a Sergio Leone film. This just kind of shows it as just like the day-to-day -day life where, you know, sometimes there are days where nothing much really happens. Um, but. I think it makes a point of showing that, you know, like you say, like, every single character's story is important and is equal to, like, you know, the story of Seth for, um, Swearingen, um, I don't know, I, I always call him Malibu, I always called him Swearingen, I, I was thinking of Mr. Wu talking to him. <laughs> yeah, Swedgen. I love how I was like, Swedgen, Wu! 
We're like, Jews? Jews! Jews! <laughs> Jews! No, no, not for Jews! Forget about the Jews! Yeah. That, that, that was a great line. I also liked kind of a little clever reversal they did where uh, the San Francisco cocksucker was, was in the room with, with Al and like Al's like talking to him like he talked to Mr. Wu but this guy actually just speaks English. Yeah. He's like, oh, thank you very much and he just walked away. Well, that was quite a clever reversal. Yeah. And Wu was hiding in the closet. <laughs> yeah. That, that was a good little trick. Yeah. But yeah, this is like the first one where Al's been... It does feel a lot like this is a ramping up episode. You've had the murder of the prostitutes. You've had Al's actually back in the game. Even yeah. in the first episode, he was still like at a disadvantage. And yeah. But yeah, this is sort of like moving because there's only there's six episodes left now, so it's all gonna have to deal with this sort of fallout. But it's interesting in Al, like we're talking about like a villain and stuff. But like Al hasn't done anything monstrous really this season. Not really, no. He's sort of the hero now. Yeah. He's clearly gonna be the one that sort of has to save Deadwood from the people divide, dividing all the interests up and yeah yeah so that, yeah there's that going for but yeah like I obviously know it's gonna happen but yeah you're right at this point it just feels like anything, anything they're happen, gonna build yeah. the bank that's obvious and yeah they're gonna build the bank they're gonna have to do something about Francis Wilcott yeah. um, and because they're having to sort out Francis Wilcott I imagine something's gonna happen with Sai as well yeah <laughs> because there's gonna be like a domino effect yeah yeah, yeah. That's my guess. I, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but yes. I know it leaves Joni in a precarious situation because now she's got no job and, I, I, well, I'm sure Sai will be willing to take her back but as some kind of like, you know, <laughs> compromise kind of thing. Yeah. I'll have you back but you got to suck my brick every night. That's something like that. I don't know. It's tragic that, isn't it? The Joni storyline. It's awful, yeah. But poor Joni. I wonder how far in advance they plot these storylines out. Because this feels like they must have planned it sort of in season one, where yeah. she wants her her own place so much, and now she has it, and it's been just taken away from her. Awful. But even like right from the start, it's kind of been almost away from her. You know, yeah. like, like the, the the bordello owner is kind of like really controlling, and yeah. Um, I feel even from the start, things never went to plan. No. But we were talking about like the little bricks building up. You know, like I, I like how even introducing like new characters, like you know the general and the. What's it called? Hofstetler? Hofstetler, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the even interesting like new locations, like, they, they say, like, um, um, Joni comes in and she's like, oh, where are the other girls? Oh, where are the new uh, fashion store? And then later on, you actually see yeah, the yeah. clothes store, and you see, like, little hardware stores popping up, and so, and yeah, no, it's really clever how we just build it all up nice and slowly to build up this complete vision. Yeah. And now like, every single character has sort of, like, is it Maddie, the, the bordello owner oh, yeah. with Joni? Like, she wasn't much of a character, but they built in her flaw. In, it's like Shakespearean. They built up her flaw in the first episode yeah. that she's out to extort Francis Wilcott for money. Yeah. And then it comes into play. That's what eventually kills her. Like, she had the, she was stood away from him and was pointing the gun. She had the opportunity to kill him, and she's like, $100,000. A year. Whenever I want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's like that. She's a very minor character. She must have had less than... She's had less than seven scenes so yeah, far. Yeah, she's only had a few scenes, yeah. But she, they built that up. That's her flaw, and that's what kills her. It's brilliant yeah. writing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's great, yeah. I think in terms of just the writing, this has been the best one as well so far. Yeah, yeah. It's just so poetic, and the way it's written, like, the confrontation... One of the best scenes... The, the best scene, I think, in this is obviously the scene between... Um, where, where he kills the prostitutes. Yeah, yeah. But I think the second best is just where Sai and him are sort of negotiating. Oh, yeah, that's great, yeah. yeah. And the language is so verbose and dense. Yeah. It's like half of the words will just go over your head because they're all uh, anachronisms. Yeah. But you understand completely the, where it is emotionally that's and where it. they're like, negotiating with it. Like you were saying about why this is better than Inherent Vice. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, that's it. I, 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 even though they, they use uh, anachronistic dialogue, I emotionally... I understand what's going on. I get like what Sai's trying to do, even if I don't understand the language that he's using. Yeah. Which is a testament to the acting and the writing and the direction. Yeah. Where even if you don't understand the dialogue, you, you get what's going on. Brilliant direction with Steve Schill. Yeah, who also wrote who wrote, who wrote, who wrote, wrote the episode. Yeah, the episode, yeah. 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 He, he clearly was the intern that week and he was scheduled to, oh, you're kind enough to direct. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how David Milch talks, but I imagine it's a bit like that. He talks um, exactly like one of the characters in Deadwood. <laughs> oh. like, risky voice. <sighs> you're kind enough to direct the next episode. Yes. Like, visually, it's also amazing. Like, obviously, the, the main thing, for, I don't think anyone talks really about how, like, well-directed it is, but it's just stunning, isn't it? Like, like the scene where Francis Walcott walks through the thoroughfare to get to the... Oh, yeah, it's yeah. just It's amazingly well done and all, because you get stuff like 
um, a thing like um, like a carriage goes past him at one point, yeah. and there's other people in the background, and like the di and like the dialogue, it's almost like a Altman film where the dialogue you have to listen over the background kind of noise. And, yeah, yeah. I, I love how so many characters mumble to themselves and like talk to themselves. They're all clearly crazy. Yeah, like all of them. Like, but there's loads of characters that like talk to themselves and mumble like, I fucking uh, get you a ton of it. Yeah, um, yeah. He's yeah. he's ready to go crazy. Oh, Francis. Crack, crack even further. Oh, Francis Wilcott. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I imagine, like, if, if it was set, like, in the modern day, yeah. um, he'd just get, like, a machine gun and just, like, gun down, like, a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Like, if it, if it was, like, uh, yeah, if it was set in the modern day. Or if it was set in Rome, he'd just go around and kill, like, Rome prostitutes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, it's obvious from the beginning that he's going to go crazy. He's oh, yeah, clearly yeah. insane. But it's not evident evident how he's gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. how they pushed him because Cy did it. Like you, if this was a weaker show, he would have just killed some prostitutes because he wanted to. Yeah. But yeah. now it's because Cy's pushed him, and because he, he sort of is like hung up on that idea that he's past the prize. Like, oh, you're past the prize. I'll surprise you with this. Yeah. <laughs> Kills them and stuff, and and almost you know because like the the, language, the word he uses is past the prize. What an what an endlessly unfolding tedium life would become, <laughs> and that gives him sort of the idea that. He has to kill that woman who he's clearly obsessed with in order to stop her from being beyond past surprise. Just amazing dialogue. And like the way that what the show normally does is if someone has a monologue, they'll be doing something else. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. This is like one of the only times. Like a good one is the brilliant speech where E.B. is washing the blood. Oh, before. yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah. And the blood is what triggers him to be talking about how sort of depressed he is. Yeah. But in this, it is just him walking, talking. This is where he's off to. Is yeah, brilliant episode. I think the best Fantastic. one so far. Yeah. Uh, what would you give it out of ten? <laughs> ten. It's easily. It's, a, it's a ten. easily a ten. Yeah. It's another fantastic episode. And oh god, how good is season two? I it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. 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 It, 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 everything just seems effortless now. Well, like, like I was saying, like in um, in season one, like you know, the episodes felt like felt like fifty minute episodes. It felt yeah. really dense, and you watch one episode, you're like, oh man. I'm satisfied. Yeah. But like with season two, it's like it's so effortless. It feels like ten minutes. Yeah. We're still dense. We're still just. I, I don't know what what the changes. We're also clearly more confident and yeah. No, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Well, I think that the changes they had were that David Milch would have understood the characters more. And he yeah. would have done that. Um, there's less sort of. I think one of the problems of season one is just they have so much to get you into That's it. That's it. Yeah. Just yeah. Think about how much you have to adapt to this show. You've got to adapt to the Western setting. You have to adapt to the highly stylized dialogue. The, the sort dense Byzantine plot. Well, yeah, the plotting is just insanely yeah. like, like all the stuff that happens in it. Little, it's because little moments add up to something a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Like season one, like the first episode, Foreshadow is the last one, but in ways that are impossible to be to really yeah. dictate. And the same thing's happening here in ways that I can't really discuss without spoiling it for you. But you've got to adapt to all that, so it t that's why it takes about three episodes for the show to get really great. Yeah. And then with this, it is just like you're in there now. If you've not it's seen like season it's one, yeah. the payoff it makes it really like rewarding when you get to this point, but you've stuck with it this far, and now it's just you know these characters and you know these plot lines. And you've stuck through season one. We're gonna kind of mess with it and kind of have fun with it. Yeah. Um, and also, I think just because the theme of the show is about evolution in a way, it's about how a town. How these damaged people come together into this town and they build something new. And I think that because it, as it's the second season, that they actually can show that evolution. Yeah. Like Bullock has a house now, which wouldn't have made sense in season one, but because it's been a year, it makes sense. They're building a bank. They couldn't have done that in season one because they had to adapt by all these characters, yeah. but it makes sense. So I think just because they can do their themes so much clearer, and I think that's another reason why. And also just because HBO gave them, because it was a, it was a. This show was the second biggest hit HBO had after The yeah. Sopranos, so they threw money at the second season, and it's all up there. Yeah, all like, shows. Yeah, so I think just the more freedom they gave David Milch and all that, it's just, I think that's the reason why it's a lot better than the first season, but yeah, incredibly great episode. The next episode is also amazing, uh, EB was left out, <laughs> which just sort of has a lot more EB. Yay! He's been sort of sidelined a little bit. He's not been in a lot, yeah. No. Yeah. He's in every episode still, but not like... He, he's got a little speech in a few. Yes. But no, he's not like... Um, but he's in that a lot. And it also includes um, one of the another one of the best speeches. It's one of the best Al moments. And it really paints um, like the, the, like the theme of what David Milch is going, to, going for. 
But yeah, EB was left out. I, I'm going to give it another 10, I think. From what I remember, I remember it being a really great episode. But yes, uh, 10 episodes, something very expensive. My highlight so far, one of your favourites. Yeah. Yes.